Welcome once again, friends, to this presentation of Landmarks of Prophecy. And tonight's study is, I think, one that is not only very important, but it could revolutionize your picture of God as it did for me. And let me give you just a little personal testimony that will help uh, lead into what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, I mentioned earlier when I shared my testimony, I went to about 14 different schools. And among those schools were a couple of different Christian schools, even though my parents were not Christians by any means. Um, and I remember hearing what many of us have heard, that if you're good, when you die, you go to heaven. And if you're bad and you die, you go to the other place where there is molten sulfur and burning brimstone and all the experience of every square centimeter of your body in flames, not for a moment or a minute or an hour or a day or a month or a year or a century or a millennium, but for eternity, you will experience blistering, burning misery, screaming, crying, writhing. And I heard that. And I thought, Wow, God's a sadist, just telling what I thought. I said, here I am, 10 years old. I mean, you know, I was young, but I could think it through. I said, he made me. No one asked me if I wanted to be made. <laughs> it seems like everybody's got this propensity to do things wrong, especially a 10-year-old boy, right? And if I should die now, I will be tortured eternally. And I said, how can I love a God like that? How can I believe in a God like that? And somewhere during that time, I threw out the idea of the Christian biblical God because I thought, this is a, a, a pagan God. And in my heart, I thought, if there is a God like that, now forgive me, I say this just to be honest, I thought I hate him. I thought he's cruel because I wouldn't do that to my dog. And I was pretty bad. When I finally learned what the Bible really teaches about this subject, it was so liberating for me. It enabled me to trust and to love God. Now, just before anyone changes the channel or says, oh, Pastor Doug does not believe in hell or the lake of fire, I do. There are two main things that we're going to study tonight. I'll just summarize it for you right now. They say that uh, part of good teaching and preaching is tell people what you're going to say, then say it, then tell them what it is you said. So let me tell you what I'm going to say. People are wrong about uh, how long hell burns and when it burns. So we're going to study that from the Bible now. And do we believe the Bible will have the answers for this? Let's find out what the Word of God teaches. We're going to begin by going to a story. Of course, our lesson tonight is lesson number 10. And it's titled, The Final Firestorm. The Final Firestorm. It begins with a story that we know from Genesis chapter 13 that talks about Lot. And uh, you can read there in Genesis 13, 13, that originally uh, Abraham and Lot were together with their sheep, but because they had so many sheep and they, the shepherds were fighting with each other, Abraham said, you know, we probably ought to split things up. And uh, he said, Lot, you pick which way you want to go. You go to the right, I'll go to the left. You go north, I'll go south. You pick first. Lot was the nephew. He should have asked Abraham, where do you want to go? And I'll take what's left. And Lot looked down at the valley of Sodom, the valley there that runs down to the very lowest point of the Jordan Valley. And it says it was watered like the Garden of God back then. It was a beautiful place. Lots of tropical fruits and food and pasture. They go, well, that's the best part of the country. He says, tell you what, Abraham, I'm going down there. My wife says she's kind of getting tired of country living anyway, and she'd like to be a little closer to the mall. And so we're going to move. We're going to move down there. Abraham, he shook his head because it says in the Bible, Genesis 13, 13, the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked. Not just wicked, exceedingly wicked. And it even tells us in Peter says that the lot, when he lived there, he vexed his righteous soul 
day by day looking at the wicked things that they did. Kind of like our culture today. Finally, God sent the angels down. You know the story. To, um, to Sodom to rescue Lot before he destroys it. And Lot was reluctant to leave because he had kids there that had married others and, and uh, he tried to get his, his sons-in-laws and his other daughters. He said, flee, the Lord is going to destroy this place. And they mocked him. And he lingered so long that finally the two angels and the people in the town were so bad they actually tried to assault and molest the angels. Well, that's going too far. And uh, the angels grabbed one of them the hand of Lot and uh, his wife and the other, the two daughters, just about pulled them out of the city. And they said, Genesis 19, verse 17, escape for your life. Do not look behind thee. Escape to the mountains, lest you be consumed. And then you read on, Genesis 19, 24, then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And you can read again now in verse 28 and it says that Abraham he heard the roar and from the hill he could look down in the valley it says he looked towards Sodom and Gomorrah and lo the smoke of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace. This really happened. And I was checking today and we, I forgot to bring something with me. I wanted to bring and show you. Uh, I've been to the Jordan Valley. I've got some friends that went to the south in the region where Sodom and Gomorrah were. They really did exist. And there's the only place in the world where you can find this, but embedded in the potash-like countryside down in this region are these little round yellow sulfur balls. Did you know that? How many of you are aware of that? Raise your hand. I see some of you. I actually brought one of those to a meeting one time and I lit it to show people. They'll just ignite. You can burn them just like that. But you know what burning sulfur smells like? Rotten eggs. It just about cleared the place out. So I just wanted to show you that this is a real event that happened. And there in that very region where they tell us they existed, they can find only place in the world just peppered in the ground are these sulfur balls that when they hit the ground some of them just extinguish themselves on impact and embedded themselves in the ash and are still there today. Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. And then the Bible tells us Genesis 19:26 what did God the angel say to Sodom and, I'm sorry to Lot and uh, his family do not look back. Why do you think he said that? because it represented looking back on the world. He was saying, flee for your life. It's like when Jesus said, if you put your hand to the plow and look back, you're not worthy of the kingdom. Jesus speaking of the second coming, you know what he says? Remember Lot's wife. One of the shortest verses in the Bible next to Jesus wept is remember Lot's wife. What happened? His wife looked back behind him and she became a pillar of salt. And it's interesting, that country down there by the Dead Sea, sometimes it's called the Salt Sea uh, because it's just so full of minerals. The water from the Jordan River is running in so fast and it's so low, hottest place on, or lowest place on earth. It's a very hot place too. That it becomes a mineral trap for all the waters there because the evaporation exceeds the input. And uh, she turned into some of the environment there. Pillar of salt. Now, what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah, the Bible says, is an illustration of what will happen to the wicked in the last days. Let's go to our first question as we um, engage this subject about what is the truth about the lake of fire and hell. You know, when, whenever I teach this subject, my father didn't use the word hell in a biblical sense. So I always feel a little bit conflicted when <laughs> I even say that in a Christian setting, but it is in your Bible. So let's uh, keep, it, keep it on that term in our mind. Number one, what two cities are given as an example for the destruction of the wicked? And you find the answer there in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 6. It says, and God turning the cities of, what's the answer? Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes condemn them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly. And by the way, that's some of the country in that picture there that uh, you find in that region. Just uh, all burn up and dry. Question number two. When will the wicked, now here's the question. What happened to Sodom and Gomorrah is an example 
of what's going to happen to the wicked in the last days. When will the wicked be destroyed in hellfire? All right, these, this is what the prophet tells us. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. The Lord knoweth how to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. When are the unjust or the wicked reserved till? When do they start getting their punishment? They're being reserved, the day of judgment, the day of the Lord. Are, if they're being reserved for punishment till then, would they be burning in a lake of fire now? No, because judgment hasn't happened, resurrection hasn't happened, right? You probably gathered this from our prior study. Jesus said, John 12, 48, the word that I have spoken, the same will judge him, he's talking about the lost, in the last day. The judgment happens when? The last day. This is when the punishment happens. They're reserved. It happens in the last day. It is future. And that should make sense. I mean, would it be fair if Cain, if you go right to hell as soon as you die, if you're bad, you're lost. Cain, who murdered his brother 5,000 years ago or more, if he went to hell right when he died, he's already been burning 5,000 years longer than Joseph Stalin or Adolf Hitler. That wouldn't be fair. And yet the Bible says every man is rewarded according to his works, that God is just. Uh, furthermore, you can read, Jesus tells a parable, Matthew chapter 13, verse 40. He tells a parable about the wheat and the tares. He says, as therefore the tares, those are weeds, are gathered and burned in the fire. He said, and this is uh, Matthew 13, 40, so shall it be in the end of the world. So, when is it going to happen? The end of the world. Jesus tells a parable that explains how the wicked are going to be dealt with. He calls it the wheat and the tares, the wheat and the weeds. And he, the first they gather the wheat into the barn. So then they gather the tares and they're burned. And Jesus says, so will it be at the end of the world. In this next verse, he fills out that parable. The Son of Man will send forth his angels and they will gather together them which do iniquity and will cast them into a furnace of fire. This is speaking of at the end of the 1,000 years when they, are, they get their executive judgment. Remember the great white throne judgment? If you were here when we studied the millennium, and so that's when they're finally getting their final judgment and they're going to be punished. Is it happening now? No. Does the Bible teach about purgatory? Do you know the teaching of purgatory really was something that was developed by the Catholic Church over a thousand years ago? And I think it was in the last five years the Catholic Church officially renounced that teaching. Are you aware of that? I don't know if all the parishes have taken it up, but they issued an encyclical that denied the belief in purgatory. So there's not this halfway, and the word purgatory comes from the word purge, which means if you're not quite good enough for heaven, maybe you just need a little bit of help. And you go to this place and you suffer a little bit and someone might pray for you and get you out of there, but that was frankly developed um, as a mechanism to in, kind of scare people into church and to also, they said, look, so-and-so, I know they went to church, but just in case they're burning in purgatory, if you make some offerings, we will pray for them. And I think you can see how that could be abused. Number three, if the wicked who have died are not yet in hell, then according to the Bible, where are they? Let the Bible tell us. Jesus said, John 5, 28 and 29, the hour is coming. That's future tense, right? In which all that are, where? In the graves shall hear his voice and come forth. Then he describes the two resurrections. They that have done evil, the resurrection of damnation, that's at the end of the 1,000 years. First, Jesus says, they that have done good, the resurrection of life. They that have done evil, the resurrection of damnation. That's the second resurrection. That's when they get their reward. The hour is coming when they'll be rewarded. It's in the future. Job 32, um, I'm sorry, Job 21, verse 30 and 32. It says, the wicked is reserved to the day of destruction, yet he will be brought to the where? the grave, and will remain in the tomb. It doesn't say this body is just in the tomb. It says he's in the tomb. He's reserved. He's waiting. Dreamless sleep till the day of judgment. They're not. And you know, that ought to make a lot of people feel better 
right there, even before I'm done with this presentation. Can you imagine how it would drive some people to distraction? A, a mother that maybe has an adult son that um, dies suddenly in what appears to be a lost condition, and if she believes that as soon as you die, you go to hell, and you're writhing, any mother who really believes that, what do you think, how do you think she's tormented by the idea that for the rest of her life while she walks the earth at the same moment she has a child that is being tortured every second? Uh, there are people who have committed suicide. People have gone insane because of this belief, this false teaching. They're asleep. You can put R.I.P., rest in peace, on any grave because until the judgment, they're aware of nothing. Isn't that what the Bible says? Number four, start at the beginning. What is the reward or punishment for sin? What did God say? Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You remember when, uh, now when I say you remember, I know you weren't back in the Garden of Eden. Nobody here is quite that old. But I was going to say you remember in the Bible when God said to Adam and Eve, do not eat the forbidden fruit or you will die. The penalty for that sin was death. The devil said to Eve through the serpent, she said, oh, God said if we eat it, we'll die. God said we'll die. And the devil said, don't believe God. You'll not really die. You're immortal. You'll either live forever in heaven or you'll live forever in hell, but you can't die. You'll be like gods. See, the devil tried to instill within man what he desires. The devil is consumed with the, the truth. It tears him up that he is not God and that he is not immortal. Even the devil has an end. So God said, even after man sinned, he didn't let him stay in the Garden of Eden. And what did the Lord say? God, Father, Son, Spirit were speaking among themselves. We need to drive man from the garden lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Was man evicted from the garden? Then we don't have that immort immortality. We are, he says he's going to die. Sinners do not live forever. Very clear. And number five, what are the only two choices for all men? It's very simple. Now, you, you, the, the strongest verse to prove this point is the most popular verse in the Bible. What is that? John 3, 16. Why don't you say it with me? This part of it. That whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This translates the same in any language. You got two options. Not, you got perish is your option if you don't believe. Eternal life is your option if you do believe. He doesn't say you're going to live eternally in fire and you're going to live eternally in heaven. He doesn't word it that way. You ever buy food that's perishable? That means it's just going to decompose and turn back into the elements of the earth. It's going to cease to exist. Uh, you ever heard someone say, perish the thought? That doesn't mean set it on fire and keep it burning. It means get rid of it. And so, but yet this teaching that came out of paganism has become very popular in Christianity. The, what is the penalty for sin? What did Jesus do on the cross? If the penalty, follow me, if the penalty for sin is eternal burning, then Jesus did not pay the full price on the cross because he's not still burning, is he? When Daniel was told he had to go to the lion's den because he broke the king's law, and the penalty was going to the lion's den. Did the king fulfill the penalty by sending him to the lion's den? Did he leave him there? One day he took him out, but he fulfilled his law. Penalty for sin is death. Jesus died. The penalty for sin is not eternal torment. Jesus, he did suffer for all the wicked in the world. He suffered like we'll never know, but it's not a perpetual time on the cross. See what I'm saying? Jesus took our penalty, which is death. He died. He's not still burning. Number six, what happened to the wicked, what will happen, I should say, to the wicked in hellfire? Psalms 37, here's our answer, verse 10 and verse 20. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be, but the wicked shall perish. Into smoke they shall consume away. What kind of words can we use that are better to explain these things? Look in Malachi chapter 4, verse 1 and 3. The Bible says, 
The day comes that will burn as an oven, and all that do wickedly will be stubble, and the day that comes shall burn them up. Now when something's burn up, what's left? And you will tread down the wicked, for they are ashes under the soles of your feet. You know, um, there's a picture here in the screen of what you saw there, I think it's gone now, was Pompeii. And it's right near Mount Vesuvius in Italy. And I've been there. I went there years ago when I was on that boat that sailed around the Mediterranean. They took us, and I'll tell you, it was very sobering for a 16-year-old to go and to see all these forms of bodies that were frozen in position because they were basically burned to death by the, uh, the heat and the gases and the ash, hot ash that was raining all around them. Uh, it must have been very much like what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. And suddenly, they, you know, one day everything was fine. And then right after that, both Pompeii and Herculeum were just in, enveloped in death and fire. And Jesus said, remember Lot's wife. The things can happen suddenly. Um, one more little amazing fact about this that I thought was interesting. Uh, Mount Vesuvius blew up and Pompeii was buried in about 79 A.D. Pompeii was, it was the Sodom of the Roman Kingdom. It was the Las Vegas. Nothing against our friends in Las Vegas that are watching right now, but you know what I mean, they call it Sin City. It was where the soldiers from the Roman Empire went for their R&R. &R. And they still know, I've been there, I've seen it. They've got the paintings of the brothels and all this just stuff that ought to make anyone blush, basically pornography. It's on the walls and the statues all throughout this city. And you see the judgment that fell on this place. And you see with your own eyes what they were prizing and what they were doing and what, they, what their art and entertainment was. And it harkens back to what happened with Sodom and Gomorrah. And it also speaks to our world and our country today that is obsessed with immorality and violence. One more little bit of trivia. The Roman legion under Titus that were instrumental, the specific uh, troops in destroying Jerusalem were vacationing in Pompeii when the mountain blew. Isn't that amazing? Of course, it was nine years later, but you wondered if it was some kind of a uh, forestalled judgment. Number seven, where will hellfire be located? I don't know how to tell you this, but it will be in Albuquerque as well as everywhere else. You can read in Revelation 20, verse 9. It says, And they went up on the breadth of the earth, and they encompassed the camp of the saints about. So before God rains that fire and brimstone down, where, where is the devil and all the forces of Gog and Magog, all the wicked? On the earth. And it says, And fire came down from God out of heaven, and, and what? Devoured them. Where is it? On the earth. You can read in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, the elements will melt with what kind of heat? Fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. And yet how many of us have heard hell is somewhere down yonder, right? Way down there in the molten somewhere the devil's got these burning uh, caverns. And... Uh, I remember one time I was checking out of a market somewhere and they had these supermarket tabloids. And I told you, I don't buy them, but I do sometimes. You can't help but read the covers. Matter of fact, sometimes I've just blurted out laughing. I think this was one of those times. The cover said, oil well drillers drill too deep in Siberia and demons escape from hell. <laughs> I think it says, first they heard shrieks coming out of the well. <laughs> and you know, that's actually not that odd. But you ever put a seashell to your ear? you dwell an oil well down that far, you're going to hear <laughs> things coming up. It's not devils. The devil isn't down there somewhere in the molten under the ground. When God says in the book of Job, Satan, where'd you come from? He didn't say, I came from a hole in the earth. He said, I came from walking to and fro on the earth. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is going around as a roaring lion seeking whom he might devour. He's roaming to and fro on the earth. He's not hiding out down in an office down there somewhere. Satan's on the earth. It doesn't say that hell is in a... Show me scriptures. You know why? I'll tell you why people get that idea. It often talks about descending into hell in the Bible. And those terms is... Many of them are from Hebrew. It's 
a word called Sheol in the Old Testament, and it means grave. The word that you find in the Old Testament frequently, that will not leave my soul in hell, that translates Sheol, it just means grave. That's all it means. Four words in the Bible are translated for hell. Sheol in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, you've got three. You've got Gehenna, which was a valley outside of Jerusalem called the Valley of Hinnom. Uh, you've got Hades, which comes from Greek mythology. And you've got Tartarus. It's only used one time in uh, the writings of Peter. Um, Gehenna was the city dump the Valley of Hinnom, they used to have idols there and so they decided to make it a city dump because they had worshipped pagan images down there. And all of the refuse was put in there and they, when an unclean animal died, it went to Gehenna. And um, they had their old baskets there and old cloth there and every now and then someone would throw their ashes out there and it was, oh, it was smoldering because they still had hot coals in it. So they let it burn, it was good. It kept the gases down and, and it helped consume things. Any of you ever burn garbage? When I grew up in New York City, we had, we'd walk out of our apartment. We had an incinerator. We just opened this trap and you throw your garbage down. And back then, we didn't care about pollution when I grew up. And the air in New York was bad, but everybody had, all these buildings had incinerators in the basement. Any of you remember those things? Yeah. And we just kept it burning. And so Jesus is referencing one of his references to hell. He talks about a place where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. It was full of worms and dead bodies and maggots and it was smoldering and that's Gehenna. That's the word that he uses for Gehenna. Number eight, will the devil be in charge of hellfire? Yeah, we often see him with his trident or his pitchfork. Could you trust him to reward people evenly? No, Revelation 20, and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. You can say amen there. That's good news. I mean, if anyone deserves to go there, he does, right? He started all the problems. He's not in charge. Could you trust him? Amazing Facts actually has a lesson. It's called, Is the Devil in Charge of Hell? And uh, obviously, he would be the most untrustworthy person you could think of to reward people evenly. You know where that comes from? I remember when I was um, a boy in New York City, I went to public school, and they had a school play. They were trying to teach us about the Greek gods mythology. So they had a school play on the Greek gods and uh, I don't know why they asked if I would play Pluto, the god of Hades from the underworld. And he had these dogs. You ever heard of the, the, the hounds of hell? And uh, he was in charge of helping people suffer in Hades. Jesus actually uses that term from Greek, Greek mythology when he tells the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Now that's one of the things you're going to ask me about uh, it's in the back of your lesson. It explains the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. It appears one place in Luke. It is clearly a parable, but I'll say more about that tomorrow. And uh, so I, I learned back then that a lot of what has come into Christianity trickled in from the Greco-Roman religions because Christianity absolutely exploded uh, in, in growth in the Roman Empire during the time of Paul. I mean... Even Paul says the gospel's been preached to every creature. The church grew so quickly. Pentecost, thousands were baptized. Miracles were happening. And a lot of the pagans were only half converted. They came in and not being properly taught, they tried to mix up the truths from the word of God about the devil and hell and they got it mixed up with Greek mythology and Pluto and, and Hades and some of those things stayed for years. But it's not a biblical thing. It's a, it's a Greek myth found its way into the Christian church. Nowhere in the Bible does it say the devil's in charge of hell, does it? No. Number nine, will the fires of hell ever go out? This is the, this is the big question where I want to spend a moment. Isaiah 47, verse 14. It says, There shall not be a coal to warm at, nor a fire to sit before it. It says, You'll go forth, the wicked are ashes under the soles of your feet. After God rains that fire down on heaven upon the wicked, it forms a lake outside the city of God. Everybody is punished according to what they deserve. And the only way I can understand that is there'll be a difference of intensity and duration. Some may expire immediately. Think about people that never heard the gospel or they were young and they didn't know. God is merciful. He's just. Others will suffer longer. But Christ said everybody is punished according to what they deserve. 
But ultimately, it goes out. It says, you'll go forth and you tread upon the wicked for they are ashes under the soles of your feet. Blessed are the meek, they will inherit what? The earth. It's the meek are walking out. I heard a pastor say one time, today sheep graze where dinosaurs thundered. And Christians will walk where the wicked once ruled. The meek will inherit the earth. Number 10, are both the soul and the body destroyed in hell? Now, if you don't believe Pastor Doug, will you believe Pastor Jesus? Some people say, well, Doug, you're right. The bodies don't burn forever, but the souls burn forever. I've heard some people say that. Oh, let's see what Jesus said. Matthew 10, 28, he said, Fear not them that kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy, to do what? Destroy both soul and body in hell. What did Jesus say? He said, fear the one who can destroy soul and body. He said, don't fear the devil. He can only hurt your body, but God is the one who will destroy soul and body in hell. And that's what we should fear. Now, what's left when the soul and body are gone? Nothing. And you'll perish. Number 11. For whom will hell fire be kindled? Matthew 25. I know we're rushing along, friends, because we, we got like 18 questions in tonight's presentation. Matthew chapter 25, verse 41. Jesus, when he separates the sheep from the goats in this parable, he says to the wicked, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Well, there you have it, Pastor Doug. Everlasting fire. It says it's going to last forever. Stay with me. We'll get to that in a minute. But is the devil in charge of hell? Or does it say that he, that hell is prepared for him and his angels? So it's not just Satan. All the fallen angels and the demons that followed him, they're going to get that same punishment. So how does the Bible refer to God's destruction of the wicked? Is it something he enjoys? No. Isaiah chapter 28, ver, uh, verse uh, 21 it says, the Lord will be wroth that he may do his work, his strange work, and bring to pass his act, his strange act. Someone asked earlier in one of the questions, how can a God of love destroy? Does he enjoy that? Does God like destroying? You remember when God destroyed the world in the days of Noah? He used water. Are they still drowning today or are they gone? He said, next time I'll do it with fire, but he's going to destroy the world again. But it says it grieved God at his heart that he made man. He was not hop happy about what he had to do. It broke his heart. God wants to make life. He wants to save life. If you doubt that, why did Jesus come? Because he's desperate to save us. When he has to destroy the lost, no, you do not love your children more than God loves his children. It hurts God infinitely more than it would hurt any earthly parent to have to take the life of their own child. Jesus is a lover of good. He is a lover of life. He wants to give life. I'll tell you a quick story. <clears throat> when I lived up in the mountains, I told you I lived in a cave for about a year and a half. Um, and I cooked on a fire every day. Um, and uh, I remember one night, I had a cat up there. I think I showed you a picture if you were here. My cat, Stranger. And I never bought cat food. Every now and then I'd throw him a little something, but... He pretty much took care of himself because he was a good hunter. Um, he was like a little lion because sometimes he'd catch these squirrels that were pretty big and there'd be a fierce battle. <laughs> and he always wanted to bring it to me. And, uh, but you know, one, one night I was cooking my dinner and I had a little campfire there and I had a chair and a, a kind of a stone chair and my campfire and a stranger had caught a little kangaroo rat. Now, you know, cats are a little bit sadistic. You know, a dog will catch a rat and he just gulps it down. They don't even chew. But a cat, they like to play with their food as long as it's alive. They kind of bat it around. They jump on it, pounce. They let it go. They pounce again. And, and kangaroo rats can really jump. Well, he had caught this kangaroo rat. And it always made me feel bad because they're cute little things. And um, these little desert mice. And he was going through his ritual of pouncing on the thing and letting it go. And I remember one time, stranger, he, he caught a mouse 
and uh, he was beating the thing up and I just thought, oh, please put it out of its misery, poor thing. You know, it was still alive and quivering and, and an owl came down to grab the mouse. My cat jumped on this little pygmy owl. He got the owl and the mouse got away. <laughs> so there is hope. I just want you to know, sometimes they do make it. <laughs> but on this occasion, I'm going back now, I'm mixing up my stories. There he was again. He was playing with his food. And that poor little dazed kangaroo rat, he tried to bounce and hop away, and he hopped right into the fire. Now, I, it never fails to, to get a gasp from the audience when I tell that story. Here you are, I'm telling you about this little mouse that went into the fire, and it just breaks your heart, doesn't it, that little thing. Just the idea of that little rat suffering. Now, it seemed like a long time, but he... he I watched it, you know, it just it squeaked and writhed for probably two, three seconds and it stopped. And it probably even hurts you to think about that. A mouse. You don't want it to happen to a mouse. And yet, many Christians believe that God's going to do that and much worse to humans forever. Think about that. It's just, it's, it's amazing, but, and you know, if you say anything against it, people say, oh, you don't believe the Bible. Sure you do. Now, there are some verses that are confusing, and we're going to get to those. Number 13. Doesn't the Bible phrase unquenchable fire indicate that the fire never goes out? Well, no. What does it mean to quench? Quench is a verb that means to extinguish. Let me give you an example. Interpret the Bible with the Bible. There's a rule. Let the Bible be its own expositor. It doesn't contradict itself. You can read, for instance, in Matthew chapter 3, verse 12, it says, He will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, and he will burn up. What does burn up mean? It's gone. He will burn up the chaff, speaking of the wicked, with unquenchable fire. That means no one is going to be able to extinguish the fire that God is going to use to punish the wicked. Have you ever seen a house catches on fire? If, heaven forbid, a person's clothes catch on fire while they're cooking, you quickly, you quench it. But there'll be nobody quenching in the lake of fire. Another example, I'll give you two of them. Revel I'm sorry, Jeremiah 17, 27. This is before the destruction of Jerusalem by King Nebuchadnezzar. The prophet Jeremiah warned them, if you will not hearken unto me to hallow the Sabbath day, and not to bear a burden, even entering the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, then I will kindle a fire in the gates thereof, and it will devour the palaces of Jerusalem, and it shall not be quenched. There you got it again. God says through His prophet that if they did not repent, that the gates of Jerusalem would be burned with unquenchable fire. They did not repent. Nebuchadnezzar came. The gates were burned with unquenchable fire. Nobody put it out. Burnt them up. Are they still burning today? No, it just means there would be nobody to put it out. Again, you can look here. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Does anyone go, if you get the dump burning, that's actually a good thing. It just keeps the gases down. It smolders. You don't have to worry about a volcano that is constantly spitting out lava. They usually don't blow because the pressure is always being relieved. And if a dump is just burning the gas all the time and burning the trash, it keeps the levels down, they used to let their dumps burn. They, you, they guarded them, make sure the fire didn't spread. Any of you ever um, drive across Texas? Texas is a big state. I used to live in Texas. I remember once, I mean, it takes you a whole day just to drive across half of it. I remember just going down this endless road somewhere and it, I saw this sign that says, the sun has riz. So what does that mean? A mile later, I saw another sign that says, the sun has set. What? And I went a little further and it said, and I am still in Texas yet. <laughs> <laughs> but every 10 miles in Texas, they got a town because they used to be farming communities and the farms could you know, only handle 160 acres back then before it got all mechanized and, and uh, all the towns had their own dump. And 
all the farmers had 55 gallon cans at their house that were cut off and they throw their, their farm trash in there, they burn it, then every now and then they take the barrel and they go throw it at the dump and they go back, but inevitably one of them still had something smoldering in there. And, and I remember one time driving across Texas and I could see two or three towns, I knew where they were because the, there was no wind that day, all the little wispy columns of the dumps burning were rising up out of sight forever and ever. The smoke ascendeth up forever and ever. That just means out of sight doesn't mean forever and ever the smoke keeps ascending. Are we going to sit on the walls of the new Jerusalem and look out at the wicked burning through ceaseless ages? Eating popcorn for entertainment? <laughs> that's, that's some idea. Some people think that, you know, God has a torture chamber somewhere where, you know, you can pay admission. You can to watch the wicked burn your enemies. Yep, they're still burning forever and ever and ever. No. When it says that the fire is not quenched, it simply means there are not going to be any firemen in hell. There is nobody going around, no firefighters putting out the fire, nobody extinguishing the fire. They are going to burn uninterrupted until they are consumed. That's the word that is used. If you quench a fire before it stops, you put out a log before it's burned up. You can burn it again later. God is saying what happens to the wicked is there is no essence left. It is burned up. It says, matter of fact, Malachi 4 leaves them neither root or branch. Nothing is left. Number 14. Doesn't the phrase everlasting fire mean unending? Now, we got the word unquenchable. We explain that. What about everlasting? Let's find out what the word means. Again, letting the Bible interpret itself. Jude 7. We read where Peter says it, now here where Jude says it, even as Sodom and Gomorrah are set forth an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. The fire that burned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah burnt them up. There is nothing left anymore. Now the picture you see there on the screen is actually, that's not Sodom. I think that's an Essene village. I just want to be accurate. It is by the Dead Sea, but that's the north end of the Dead Sea. The region of Sodom and Gomorrah is just piles of ash and mounds and hills and dirt. There's nothing there because it was burnt with eternal fire. I like this guitar, wooden guitar. I've had it for, I guess the camera can't see it. I better hold up the guitar so you know what it is I'm talking about. Bought this about 30 years ago. It's got a lot of memories. Uh, it's starting to fade, made out of wood. If I should toss it in the fire, it would be burnt. That fire would be an eternal fire because I would never be able to recover this guitar again. It'd be gone. The effect of the fire is eternal. There's no par parole. There's no reprieve. There's no resurrection for my guitar. It is gone. The results of the fire of the wicked are eternal. That's what it's saying. It's not saying that forever and ever. Just comprehend that for a minute. Think about Think about what it really means. I mean, can you imagine how horrific the, the teaching is that says that people are going to blister and shriek and writhe and burn? You have any idea? That means that a person, you know, and some preachers preach it this way, try and scare their congregations. Burning in hell, thousand years go by, they manage to swim to the surface of the molten fire and brimstone and they cry out, Lord, how long? And he plunges them back down and says, you've not even begun. A million years go by and they say, how long? Pushes them back, you've not even begun. Some of you probably heard sermons like this or at least bordering on this and you know that everybody's terrified. Oh, I forgot to show you this picture. Sodom and Gomorrah, this is the lowest place on earth is the Dead Sea, 1,300 feet below sea level. Let me tell you a story real quick. I was driving across Texas <laughs> another time. I used to live in Texas. I had a little Mazda GLC and I saw this family was stranded on the side of the road. So I pulled over to see if I could help them because, you know, it's way out in the country and, and it was a pastor, father, mother, two girls and it, I used to do mechanic work. I mean, I, would, I did mechanic work down to the crankshaft and up again. And so I looked at the car and I said, it looks like your alternator's out because his battery kept dying. It wouldn't even fire the plugs. And it was Christmas Eve. I said, tell you what, let me tow you back to our house and we'll see what we can do to help you out. No hotels around. 
And that was a funny sight because here I've got my little California, you know, Japanese Mazda GLC, and, and I'm towing this great big Texas, you know, because they had no small cars back then in Texas. The thing was like a football field. And so I, I towed it to my house and uh, managed to find the parts. I said, I can fix it for you tomorrow. They spent the night with us. And in the process of talking, he was a Baptist pastor, a Spanish pastor, nice guy. We talked about this subject. And I shared with him the scriptures I'm sharing with you. And he became very quiet and he said, you know, Brother Doug, he said, uh, I've seen these verses before and I know that if you go by these verses, it does really look like the hell doesn't last forever. But he kind of looked right and left and he said, if I was to tell that to my church, they wouldn't come anymore. I said, do you really think that they're only coming because they're afraid they're going to burn if they don't? Is that why people come to church? Is it fire insurance? Shouldn't we be coming to church because we love Jesus and we want to worship Him? I mean, but yet some people have tried to scare people into church. People that come to church for that reason, that's the whole wrong reason. You want to be, you, would you want to be in a marriage because you're afraid you're going to be tortured if you don't stay? <laughs> we hear about that every now and then. You know, people that are terrified in it about leaving. Is that why we go to church? Is, is God this, you know, galactic abusive spouse that if we leave he's going to torment us? I mean, can you take someone and shake them and by the throat and say, love me? <laughs> or I'm going to burn you. Does that work very well? That's not what God's saying. God is saying sin is a deadly contagious disease. I love you. I don't want you to perish. But the disease is going to take you if you don't come to me. He'll have no alternative. He can't let it spread among his other children in the universe. It's going to break his heart. But the wicked will be punished. There is a lake of fire. But it doesn't burn forever and ever. Number 15. When Revelation 20 verse 10 says that the wicked will be tormented forever and ever, doesn't that indicate endless time? Now this is one of the verses that I will admittedly say causes people some concern. Again, let the Bible interpret itself. The word forever, when we're talking about eternal life, of course it means eternal life. You read it in context, it talks about like the ceaseless ages. We know that it goes on. But look in the Bible and you'll find other examples where the word forever is used and it is clearly not talking about endless time. Jonah, when he was swallowed by the great fish or the whale, in chapter 2, verse 6, he prayed from the belly of the fish. He said, the earth with her bars was about me forever. Now how long was he there? We all know, three days and three nights, it's what it says in Jonah 1.17. Do you think it felt like forever? I'm sure it did for Jonah, but it wasn't. Now look, I'm going to quickly go through some scriptures, uh, no pictures, just some scriptures up here because I want you to catch this. Revelation 14 verse 11, the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever. What does this expression forever and ever mean? You go now to Exodus 21 verse 6, it says that you could have a Hebrew slave at the end of six years, if your slave loved you and he wanted to stay, you went through this ritual and it said he will serve him forever. How long did that mean? Till he died. When Hannah brought Samuel to the temple, she said he will abide here forever. How long did that mean? Till he died. In 1 Samuel 1.28, she explains it herself and says as long as he lives. The term forever meant for the remainder of your existence. So when it talks about the wicked burning forever and ever. The word there used in Greek is eon. You ever heard someone say, I haven't seen them in eons. Does that mean forever or mean just a long unspecified period of time? The reason the Greek New Testament writers use that word eon there is because everybody burns a different period of time based upon their judgment. There's varying intensity, varying times, but they're not going to burn forever. I don't know how long. It, you know, the devil, when talked about day or night, if anyone deserves that, that's him, right? <laughs> Forever and ever is a biblical expression which means until the end of the age, not necessarily an infinite, unending length of time. Number 16. After sin and sinners are destroyed, what will Jesus do for his people? You can read here in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 13. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. There's no more pain there. 
You read in Revelation 21 verse 4, God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death. Neither shall there be any sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more what? Pain. No more pain. For the former things are passed away. Behold, I make all things new, God says. Is God going to immortalize Satan and sinners in a torture chamber somewhere in the cosmos? No, not their bodies, not their souls. He is going to make all things new. There are no holdovers, no chance of the devil escaping again. Number 17, will the sin problem ever rise again? No, don't have to worry about the devil escaping from maximum security. It tells us in the book of Nahum 1 verse 9, affliction shall not rise up again the second time. Praise the God, this terrible interruption in God's perfect universe for the last 6,000 years is going to demonstrate for all eternity that God is love and no one will ever have to doubt His love again. That's good news. Don't you believe? Number 18. What penetrating question does Job ask? Book of Job, oldest book in the Bible. He says in Job chapter 4 verse 17, shall mortal man be more, we're mortal, shall mortal man be more just than God. We would not do that to our dog. We would not do it to a mouse, we found out tonight, most of us. And yet, some people believe that God is going to do it. What is going to happen? Is there a hellfire? Is there? Yes. Is it burning yet? No. Does it burn forever? What does the Bible say will happen to the wicked? They are consumed. These are Bible words. They are devoured. They are burnt up. They perish, never shall they be anymore. What other language is God going to use to explain this? That He wants to make it as clear as it can be. And the reason it's important to understand this subject, friends, is because God wants us to trust Him. God wants us to love Him. Yes, we're to revere and honor God and fear Him in that respect, but He doesn't want us to live our lives in terror. The Bible says the fearful will be cast into the lake of fire. He doesn't want us to live by fear. He wants us to live by faith. Amen? And he wants you to have that kind of love relationship with him. I was so thankful when I learned this truth about God's love. And he wants you to believe in his love too. I didn't like to invite John to come out with Kelly. And we're going to pray with you in just a moment. And I'd like you to just listen to this beautiful song. It's one of my, my favorite songs. Just We only have time for probably one, one verse of it. But it speaks of that wonderful love of God. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. The than anything God wants you to be ready when Jesus comes God so loved you that he gave his son that you should not have to perish but have everlasting life he wants you to live everything God does is good good very good but he can't force you 
He's created all of his intelligent creatures in his image with a free will. You get to choose. He says, come unto me. He stands at the door and he knocks. And you're, you're the one that has the doorknob. There's no doorknob on his side. You must open the door. If you hear his voice, do you want to open that door now, friends, and say, Lord, I think I can love and trust a just God like this with my life. Maybe you've had a distorted concept of who this God is. He wants you to know now that he is a God of love. He is a God of justice. He is going to be fair in the judgment. But there still are only two rewards, life and death. Jesus wants you to choose life. Is that your desire, friends? Let me pray with you. Dear Father, I am so thankful for this truth. It set me free so that I know that you're a God that I can love. You are a God of compassion and mercy and tender pity. You are not a sadist. You are not cruel. And I pray that if there are some who are struggling with this presentation, that they'll only find the answers in the Bible. I pray, Lord, that you'll make the truth very clear and that we'll, it'll help us to get a new picture of your goodness and how that we can trust you. If there are some that are going through struggles right now about what it means to surrender and trust their lives to you, give them the courage to do that. I pray you continue to bless this study, these meetings. Pour out your spirit, transform us, and help us be ready for your return because we believe you're coming soon, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, listening friends, when is our next meeting? You want to make sure and come Tuesday night because we've got a very special presentation. We're going to be talking about the longest time prophecy in the Bible. It's going to be a great in-depth Bible study from the prophecies of Daniel. We'll be touching on the prophecies of Revelation, talking about the Ark of the Covenant. Fascinating. It's still not too late for you to bring a friend, and we hope that you'll also tell them they can tune in online and watch through the Internet. God bless you. We'll see you next meeting, Tuesday night.